Good afternoon. One and a half year ago, I was standing here as an invited professor. And now I'm joined this great family, and I feel proud of it. And I want to take the chance to say thank you to all of you for making me feel like in home. It's not easy to say that, but uh, I really do. So I'm going to try to uh, cover some points. Uh, these are my goals about the talk. And I'm, honestly, I don't pretend to uh, resolve any of those, those doubts. I hope that you are going to take those doubts back home. If you think about it, if the next time that you face the patients, you think about it, then my goal is rich. When we talk about glaucoma, we talk about a general disease that uh, basically killed the retinal ganglion cells and in which the IOP is one of the risk factors. The European Glaucoma Society defines the glaucoma basically like a chronic progressive optic nerve disease. As you can see in the definition, there is no IOP mentioned. If we talk about etiology, it remains unclear. There is multiple genetics factors, comorbidities, and still the pressure is not included. What is the pressure? Pressure is involved in the pathophysiology. The deformation of the lamina cribosa related to the level of intraocular pressure it's what it causes the damage, but not all the eyes respond in the same way to the same level of IOP. So that will really question the way we treat the patient. It's something that we should think about it. When we talk about the pressure, mainly it's the only factor that we are able to modify. That's why it's so important to us. I don't know if you know these devices. This is the trigger fish. It's basically is the holter. It's a holter for intraocular pressure. It's useful. Well, so-so. I had the, the opportunity to work in Europe in the development uh, when, they were, when they were trying, testing this device. And what we found, and I'm going to mention a little bit about it, this is that patient that I show you on the picture. And as you can see, basically, the most important thing is this device doesn't measure pressure. What it measures is electricity, microvolts. It, it measures the change that the anterior segment of the eye suffer, supposedly related to modifications of the pressure. But what you can see is this patient has a progression in glaucoma. During our daily visit, which is this time frame, the pressure was in a normal level. But at night, while she sleep between 3 a.m. to 9 a.m., the pressure, or whatever we were measuring, in that case, microvolts, it was very, very high. 12 after the treatment, you can see that there is a flattening of that core. So the stabilization of the IOP, the flattening of the fluctuation, is an important risk factor in the progression of glaucoma. When we talk about the prevalence, there are many, many studies about it. The important thing that you have to keep in mind is that 50% in all the studies are undiagnosed. That is our goal, trying to reach those part of the population that is probably not diagnosed. There are many factors involved. There are some that are strong association, like the intraocular pressure, the age is age-related, ethnicity, different races, has different progression in the glaucoma and different presentation of the glaucoma. The family history is very important. Then some moderate association, we don't have it very clear, myopia, diabetes. We know that patients that have myopia and diabetes tend to assist to see the ophthalmologist more often, and that is one of the relations sometimes they found. And some weak association like systemic hypertension or migraine or vasospans that is not totally clear. And for the diagnosis of the glaucoma, well, our basic, as I said, is the pressure, but mainly because it's the only thing we can change. The slit lamp exploration is very important because it will give us the idea of what are the other risk factors associated, pseudo exfoliation, pigmentary glaucoma, neovascularization, all of those 
will change our concept about the way we have to treat these patients. The synechias or the widen of the angle is, is going to give the last name to this glaucoma. Not only the name is important, it's also very important the last name of the glaucoma because according to that, we're going to adjust our treatment. Nerve fiber layer and optic nerve is the key point. The problem with the investigation and research in glaucoma is that we have three different areas. The studies are oriented to the ciliary body, the production of the aquasumor, trabecular meshwork, where the outflow is, and the target organ, which is the optic nerve. That is so, so dense, and that's why the investigation in glaucoma doesn't go as fast as we would like. Visual field is very important too, but has one inconvenience that is key. And the inconvenience is that it depends on the reliability of the patient. If the patient understand the test, the patient is going to do it good. For us, it's not only one of these part of the exam. The important thing is that everything match as a puzzle. If you had a damage in the optic nerve, it should match with the visual field. You should look for an uh, aggressive factor like the pressure or any other condition that is involved in this progression of the patients. When we talk about the histopathology of the glaucoma, there are many changes. What it seems to happen is that it's an early change as the one related to the age. In some cases, the collapse of the Schlem canal is what it produces that the aquasumor cannot leave the eye, but it's not the only mechanism. So that's why it remains unclear. This has about 12 years. I think that when uh, Weinreich present this, but for me, it's one of the most important things because it tells us the progression of the glaucoma. We are only able to detect the changes that the glaucoma will have when the disease has passed two-thirds of the vital cycle. So it's very important to try to detect the earliest we can, because mainly when we do that, we will have more options to work. And what are the principles of the treatment? Basically, as I said, the, the, the goal of the treatment is the pressure, because it's what we can change. But of course, we have to preserve the quality of the vision, the quality of the life, according to a res reasonable price. And what is that pressure? Well, basically, most of the studies said that if we are able to decrease the pressure 30%, from the basic level in which we make the diagnosis, we're going to be moving into a safe place. But one of the most important studies was the Advanced Glaucoma Intervention Study, and it found that if the pressure in all the visits remain below 18, the progression of the visual field or the damage in the optic nerve was really, really slow, or it was none. So that's why we keep in our mind that we have to keep the pressure the lowest we can, and if it's below 18, the better. But at what cost? This is what the European Glaucoma Society tell us as the whom to treat graph. If you see these lines, the line eight is the normal decrease that everyone has related to the age. The line B is a moderate rate of progression, but in an early uh, in an old patient. So if we have this line, how aggressive we have to be in a patient that probably has a life expectancy of 10, 15 years, or the same situation if it's in the life expectancy is only five or more years. The line C is the same progression rate, but in a younger patient. We have to act differently in both situations. Line D is a slow progression rate but in a patient that is tolerating well that. We, we should not create an extra stress in the patient. If the patient is not feeling anything and we are observing that there is not changes fast in the, in the visual function, we should consider that at, at, at the moment of initially the treatment. On the contrary, the line E is a very fast progression of the disease. That is something we have to act and probably very aggressive in order to slow down that progression. According to all these factors that we are going to get that target IOP. And most of those factors are related to the glaucoma damage, the life expectancy, the untreated level of IOP, 
The additional risk factor as pseudo exfoliation, pigmentary glaucoma, neovascularization, or the rate of progression. According to that, we have to adjust that level of IOP. And how we adjust the target. The most important is when we are evaluating a patient, having in mind that that level of pressure we consider is the target pressure can be adjusted between visits according to what we find in this patient. This is a case. This is uh, the optic nerve in one eye. You can see the uh, enlargement of the excavation, the matching of the visual field with a defect, clearly a glaucoma, in the other eye between the normal limits. It matched the pusley with the visual, with the OCT in that eye, important defect here. If you trust the ganglion cells, you can see that there is this important damage in one eye and start the damage in the other eye. We're going to talk about the solution of this case later on. So now we have the steps of the treatment. What are we going to do? Those steps will, relay, will be based on age and the disease progression. But most of us will be agreed that our first step, it will be a start with medication. Well, we have all of these medications. As you can see, some of them came from the 19th century. And the last fixed combination came in this century. According to that, and taking into consideration some systemic contraindication, how is the surface of the eye, all the concomitant disease, we're going to choose our first medication. Can you start with fix, full, or more than one medication? Yes, you can. But the important thing is you must know the response to the treatment if it's according to the drops you are using. If you start right away with full medication, you don't know if all of them are working. And that is important to know. Sometimes it seems that they are all working, and some of them are causing side effects that you don't want that side effects. According to that, you have all these first choice monotherapy. And as the European guidelines said, probably I will change this as I get used to the Saudi guidelines, uh, as you had, all these drops should be changes according to their response to that treatment. But take into consideration that if you use more than one medication, the patients are on a only be compliant according to some studies in 30% of the cases. As you add more drops, the patients comply less. It's not easy. Think about it. This is a study of basic on the washing effect. What mean washing effect? Well, if I use a drop and I wait only 30 seconds of interval between that first drop and the second drop, I'm only going to have a biodisponibility of the medication in 50%. If I wait two minutes, the biodisponibility of the medication is going to be 83%. And if I wait five minutes, I will have the full biodisponibility of the medication. But how many of our patients will wait five minutes between drops if they have three drops? Will you wait five minutes between drops? That means 15 minutes in the morning, 15 minutes in the night. You probably have to watch TV. So it's something important to keep in mind when we prescribe the medication. The second thing related to the interval between the drops is that if you wait the five minutes, the, the maximum decrease of pressure, the maximum effect of the drop you're going to get. If it's quick, the waiting, you're going to have less reduction. So the add phenomenon of the medication is not like I give full medication and I don't give the direction of leave the interval between the drops. That plus the lacrimal point occlusion is very important when you use the medication. We did a paper on the, when the last prostaglandin came out, which was the uh, bimatoprost, and we found that even with the good ones, the patients will decline in using it. At the end, most of the patients, and you can see it, I will say that my patients in Spain are quite similar to the Saudi patients in the way that, have you used the drops? Well, I ran out of the medication one month ago. The same answer I received in Spain, I receive it sometimes here. So 
we did a study in, in Spain, and I'm sorry that the paper is in Spanish, but you, here it said that most of the patients need twice or three times trying to put the drops, and in about 30% of them, the drops fell in a different place than the eye, nose, cheek, and some other places. These are two real patients that we ask to put the drops. As you can see, she puts a lot of them. She's still saying that she has only one drop in, and this one, this lady lost one eye because of glaucoma. She said that she put the drop, but you can see that she did not put any drop. The feeling, the problem with the patients is that there are a lot of things depends on how the patients use the drops. Hardness of the containers, some of the bottles are very hard, shaking hands and arms, all patients has a lot of these problems. Installation, that usually is not appropriate. The best treatment in medication is the one you put in the eye. If you don't put it in the eye, it won't work. And the compliance will depend on different factors. This is another lady, and she's complaining that, well, she has the glaucoma, she has one drop, and, but the bottle is very hard. And she developed her own system to apply the medication. And we were wondering, and the next visit we said, well, why don't you bring your system to apply the medication? Do you know what is this? You use it here too, right? Not that very good for the heart. So she had that nutcracker, and she used to squeeze the bottle. So some patients are very creative in the way to use the medication. But the important thing is when we talk about drops, when we talk about meds, we really have to discuss that point with the patient. I think that in a lot of points, it's very important that the patients understand the importance of using the drops to keep the pressure at that level. And that is probably, right now, I will say, is my main concern. I'm not able to communicate as I would like, and I will thanks publicly to all the translators that helped me, but I will really will, will enjoy to understand how the patient said, or what the patient said about the administration of the drops. So once we pass the MET status, then we go into another way of treatment, which is the SLT or the laser treatment. SLT against the ALT has the advantage that it doesn't change the anatomy of the trabecular meshwork. And in this study, based by CATS, the FDA approved the use of SLT as, as, as initial treatment. Basically, because the effects compared with the medication was similar at 25 to 30% of reduction of the IOP. The good thing is that residents do as good as the consultants. So anyone can do the SLT, and it will be a good option. And also, the important thing is that the SLT has a reduction of about 23, basically is what every medication has as an as a additive uh, effect. And it works better in the pigmented trabecular meshwork. Depending on the, uh, on the pigmentation of the trabecular meshwork, the effect of the SLT is even larger. So when you, you keep going up the stairs, you have that if you start with the medication as the first step or the SLT, the second step should be the opposite. That's in theory, right? And that's what we are talking, but what happened if that effect of IOP control is not reached? The IOP fluctuation can be a, a second factor, or there are some other things in play in the progression of the glaucoma. Then we will have to think about the surgeries. And what surgeries do we have? Well, our most common, the trabeculectomy, is the most popular, it's the gold standard. In some cases, it's the gold standard because the Americans said that it's the gold standard. But 50% of the cases at 20 years need to add medication or need to have a second surgery. That is in the Otago glaucoma uh, surgery uh, study, which was a large, with something like 900 uh, trabeculectomies done and followed for 20 years. The surgery that we prefer, at least in Europe, and, I, I, and here the K. Kalish has a lot of experience 
even in children, that is fantastic, is the DS. And the DS, one of the guys that has more of these uh, results is André Mermo in, in Switzerland. And he already has 10 years of follow-up in which the qualified success was in 80%. It means control of the pressure with medication, and in 50% of them, without medication. So it's, it's quite similar to the trabeculectomy results. The key steps is, in some cases, peeling that out uh, in the uh, wall of the Schlemm canal. But the important thing is to have a slowly decompression of the eye. So that's why the anterior chamber looks so good the next day if there is no leaking, right? <laughs> and, and what about the tubes? We have a lot of experience with the tubes. Uh, the reason why the tube and trap study said that we should use tubes before traps was based on the complications rate. But if you think about it, you say, well, the, the volume that those tubes and valves has and the space that I'm using in the eye, it really uh, it's, should be before doing a trap. This is something that to, to think about it. I don't have the answer for this. I think that I will look for that answer while I'm here. The rate of complications related to infections, it's quite low in DS, then seems to be less also in tubes, as long as the tube is covered. If there is an extrusion of the tube, then the rate of endophthalmitis increases, of course, and the trap is the one that has more risk of late endophthalmitis. Based on that, where I will put those surgeries? Well, I will put my filtration at the midway if the patient is phakic and I'm only going to do a filtration surgery, I will put it a little bit below. I would prefer to do a DS instead of a trap if, the, if I'm not going to remove the catheter. And for my opinion, the tubes and valves will be a little bit over the filtration surgeries. What about the rest of all the laces we have? Well, the, right now, one of the best, in my opinion, is the ECP because you can release the energy in the area you want to treat under direct visualization. That's the difference with the CPC. And it seems that in refractory glaucomas, it seems to work as good as the Ahmed valve, at least at two years follow-up. So it's a good option if you have a clear view, you can get into the area that you're going to treat, and you are able to do it. And, this, and you have the equipment, of course. There are some other new devices. We just have this one for demo here, so I cannot really tell how it works. But it seems that at six months, it gives also like 30% reduction of the pressure. The advantage that seems to have over the CPC, it's based on the uh, release of energy. It seems to be less energy than the CPC itself. This is the one we have now. Here, the cycloplastia that is done with the, with the uh, uh, ultrasound. The technology of the ultrasound, it's, I was not going to do that. The technology of the uh, ultras ultrasonic is based on old technology. It has something like 25 years. It was used to treat brain tumors. If you see the difference, these are the marks that the CPC does through the sclera, and these are the modification of the ciliary body that is done, the cycloplasty that is done with the uh, ultrasound, the UCP. But it seems that it's not only an action of a, the ciliary body. It seems that it's also modification of the supracoroidal space and intrascleral space involved in the reduction of the pressure. How good it is? Well, till now it seems that reduce the pressure about 30%, and that seems to be our magic number. Uh, the only thing is that we don't have long data experience. There are some published three years that say that it keeps that low profile of pressure, and that it could be some early failure in 90 days, some late failures, or success more than six months. We will probably develop our own experience, and then we can talk about this and show to the world if it's really good or not that good. 
but based on that and follow put in the place, I will put the ECP a little bit over the tubes if it's only the ECP, the micro poles, and I'm not very fan of the CPC. And then if I have to do a FACO, then I will think about combining with the ECP. That will be a little bit my, my steps, but I think that each one of us should have their own steps. Of course, the DS and the UCP could be a little bit there, and then we have all these areas. What are we gonna put in here? Well, we have the famous mix. What about the mix? Well, are all the same, they are not the same. This one, this year was without withdrawal from the market due to a five-year follow-up. Uh, it shows a loss of endothelial cells rate of about 30% at five years. But the worst was that it was constantly since the first year until the year five that that loss of 30% of endothelial cells was constant. Especially if two of these rings are shown. This is a supracoroidal device. This device has to be put in the supracoroidal space and you have to only leave one ring out. But sometimes due to the technique, which is not easy, you can leave two or three. The longer that part of the tube is outside, more risk of endothelial cells lost. And this other that is also was a supracoroidal uh, device, it's called the Supra from the Glaucos. They designed not to launch that device, waiting for the uh, result of the CPAS study. As the CPAS study came that bad, they decided to not launch that de uh, device. So right now we have all of this mix for trabecular use, the Glaucos 1 and 2, the Trabectom, the Idrus, and the Dual Blade. Idrus is going to come out, not yet. In Europe, we have been doing it a lot, but it's not commercially available. Supracoroidal, there is no anymore. And the subconjunctival is the Shen. As you can see here is the implantation of the supra, and this is the way we put it in the supracoroidal space. It is a lot shorter, but uh, we don't know what will happen with endothelial cells. So about the eye standards are very popular and in some cases expensive. Uh, it, it, we have a long, long uh, experience right now. The, it, it's going to come, I think, 12 years of experience. Dr. Neuham that published this paper at three years of follow-up and is coming to the Saudi ophthalmological meeting in March, uh, had published recently five years of follow-up. And basically he used it in patients with laser treatment, with traps, and with the same results. Result of reduction of about 30% of the IOP and a decrease in treatments of about 80%. We used to have this machine here, the trabectom. What it does is uh, it do a trabeculotomy, internal trabeculotomy with an electric shock. It's like an electrode. Uh, but the results, that is also about 30% reduction, it seems that stopped working around two years. So that's why it's decreasing the popularity. The Kahoot dual blade is similar to the trabectom. Also, that magic number of the 29 decrease at, at one year, I think it's cheaper than the trabectom, but I don't know the advantage. We use it for a year, and a year control the pressure well, but after a year, start rising the pressure again. And this is the Shen. What is the advantage of the Shen? The Shen is a device in which you really do like a trabeculectomy, but from the inter internal part. You can see the tube here through the conch, and here all the tract in the subconjunctival space. What it really is, is a trap with a tube that is based on the length of that tube and the diameter of that tube. But it's not really a mix because the care of that bleb has to be the same as a trabeculectomy except by the suturolases. You have to use mitomycin C, and right now we, the first step of the surgery is leaving a mitomycin under the conch that you're not gonna wash. So what is gonna happen with that mitomycin over 
under the conch without washing it, it will be a problem we will see in the future. But well, I think that mix will be around here, especially if you are gonna combine with the FACO. You can do all of the mix you want, depend on how well you feel. In my opinion, the shent could be a little bit one step ahead and uh, the advantage that I see is that you use the nasal area, which is difficult to reach for an, another trabeculectomy. So consideration for trabeculectomy, uh, trabecular surgery will depend on the state of the glaucoma. Should not be a very advanced glaucoma, should have pressures target around 16, the angle should be open, and should not be synechious. And it's better if you're gonna combine with cataract surgery. So our patient, the one that I showed you before, in this condition. Uh, probably it's a patient that you can consider to adjust a filtration surgery in the worst eye and any mix in the better eye, especially if the patient is gonna go and the cataract surgery. In, to summarize, in, two, in three slides, glaucoma solutions will depend on where is the damage. We have different tools right now so we can adjust those tools according to the damage we found. And at the end, we can put into the poor eye, the first step, that one, the second will be a DS or a trap over the same place. Then you have space for the shen or to put an a med valve. And if that doesn't work, you have the adi valve. At the end, these are the important things. Different types of glaucoma will need different clinical perspective, will need to analyze the pathophysiology toward the right treatment. According to the stage of the type of the glaucoma, you can add your medication or be aggressive or not that aggressive. And let the patient and the family be aware of the disease because they are gonna be your allies. The earlier the diagnosis, more things you're gonna be able to do. The later you will have to be more aggressive. And thank you again for your time and for your patience and for helping me to be at home. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for such an excellent lecture. Uh, so now we're open for questions and comments. Five minutes, you need to put drops. This means he needs to spend 30 minutes of his life just waiting for the drop to put it. So I think uh, uh, maybe surgical option is uh, better choice in this case if you have like child who's using more than two drops to control the IOB. Because you know by time they will just uh, miss up the medication and you will lose the uh, control. Uh, Vargas kicked me out of the microphone there. Uh, he knows that I'm gonna talk a lot if I'm stay here. Anyways, uh, that is a, a, a huge dilemma, you know, because you know that in most of the, of the treatment of the patients, beside, for example, uh, the, exam the, the example you gave uh, being in a kid, it depends on the family. So family has to be there, family have to add the medication. Fixed combinations could be a solution in some countries, uh, the fixed combination, there are already three meds in one bottle. Uh, that simplifies the, the administration, but it's not available everywhere. Uh, what it will be the solution? Well, at, you know, in Europe we have one, one idea. Uh, when we talk about congenital glaucoma, we always think it's surgical, surgical solution. Since I've been here, uh, I have to look for other options because the surgery is gonna help, but as I show in most long-term surgeries will fail, all of them. Uh, I don't know if in, in the room there is someone that can warranty that the surgeries is gonna last more than 20 years. In my hands, absolutely no. Uh, the surgeries will fail, as the study said, between 10, 20 years, if you're lucky, 
and it means that you have to do another surgery. No, I think that it means that you have to help that surgery sometimes with the art of medication. The problem with the kids, and it's true, the problem with the kids is that it's for the life. I did one surgery that uh, my resident gave me just the movie and I couldn't add, that I did that surgery for two and a half hour. It was a replace of an Ahmed valve that it was not working, and I put in the same place based on a paper that I read in adults, was the first time that I did in kids, I put an Adi valve, a Farvel valve. Why I was concerned that that baby had already two filtration surgeries and one valve, and it was three years old. And I said, if, if I'm able to use the same space for a new valve that might work for five more years, I'm preserving the rest of the area for the ophthalmic pediatric department. <laughs> what, uh, what about the use of uh, mix in pediatric? Anything? The, the use of? The um, neostents and... Ah, the, the, you mean the, the mixed devices? Yes. Uh, in Europe, we don't have experience. The, the last thing I heard is not approved to be used in, chi in children, so I don't think we're going to use. Which one might work? That's my idea. Of all the ones I have tested, probably the one that has a space, it will be the Shen. Because Shen is like a trap. The only thing is that you will have to do needlings in the same way. And the only thing that I will probably think about is the use of mitomycin C as Allergan recommend. Allergan recommend 0.3 injected at the subconch, far away, but in the same place where you're going to put the, when the Shen is going to exit. Uh, you know, I have seen the effects of the mitomycin C uh, with all these uh, very thin blebs in long time and you worry about what's going to happen if I leave it there and I'm not washing that mitomycin C. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question? All right. Yeah, there is also one thing add. Uh, we don't have in, in Europe as many cases of uh, this specific type of uh, hemoglobin that reacts to the acetazolamide. And here in this area, I think there are some cases of, uh, that you have to take into consideration. Well, back to the, to the, to the question. The problem with when you use the same family is that sometimes you don't get the right uh, uh, effect that you're looking, in this case, the decrease of the pressure, but you can multiply this, the side effects. It seems that by using it topical and uh, orally, there is a difference in the side effects. You will have some of the systemic side effects related to the medication the patient is taking orally, but it will also add some effect in the reduction of the pressure. I can tell you the number. Honestly, I can tell you the number. But when you see in the reality, when you see the patients that were treating adults, kids, I don't know, but when you see the adults, you can see that even if they have full medication and you add the diamox, the, the impression is that the reduction of the, of the pressure is about maybe 15, 20%. It's an impression. I cannot tell you. I haven't read any paper in which you can quantify that effect, but it's an important concern because usually you use that type of uh, treatment in advanced cases or in very high pressure in which you are looking for a uh, sustained effect. I can tell you that in what I try to do, if I have a patient in full uh, treatment, topical plus orderly, I usually had it for a period 
but I'm thinking in surgery, and it's uh, it's a w it's my way to convince the patient that it will need sooner, better than later, uh, a surgery. The, no, no, the best will be to use different topical classes. That will be the best. But with, when that fail and your only resource is to use orally the, the acetazolamide, it, it will be for a period. But if you can, what the rules always said is try to use different families. The effect, it will be much better. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Just. Uh, yeah, just thank you for the overall um, uh, overview of the lecture. Very nice. Just uh, you, you mentioned there is a company who produces uh, a three medication in one bottle. I think so it was in Belgium. I'm not sure. We don't have it in Europe, but in Belgium, a patient that I used to treat, it has pilocarpine, uh, timolol, and uh, dorsolamide. I think the three of them came together in one bottle. Do you know? Do you know what is the consideration that the pharmaceutical do when they combine these different classes, <laughs> or, or just you can compound it here? For mm -hmm. example, if you, for, you know, for many years it's a problem. We were always asking why the the brimonidine could not come together with the brinsolamide, for example, and uh, the excuse that Alcon was given was that it was difficult to prepare a suspension with a solution mixed together with the right biodisponibility. But I'm not very uh, clear on what is the problem. But Simbrinza came out many years after that. You know, uh, So it seems that it's something related to the way the medications can be uh, mixed together. Some of them will precipitate in the same bottle. So that's, that's a, the problem they usually face. Another thing is the economical uh, benefits that they are going to get, that probably it's the most important. What we face in the last two years in Europe was that some of the all good medication that we used to have disappeared from the market. And the reason was that it was not cost effective for the pharmacological enterprises. That's what they said. What about the, you know, the the Japanese group who produces the rock kinase inhibitors as anti-glaucoma? What what is the There's role of that? You mean the Santen group? Yes, Santen group that has the tafluprost and the. No, not not the Santen group. There is a there is a rock kinase inhibitor. Ah, where okay, okay. You are talking about the new ones. Yeah. Ah, okay. Well, those ones are gonna come out now. The Rokinasa inhibitors, and those ones seems to work because they are totally different families now. So if we talk about the future, they are going to probably in the next five years, it's going to be launch five, probably four to five new medications. And two of them are from a different family group. So we're going to have now six options in the future. And some of them are the Rokinasa that could be joined to the prostaglandins analogs like the Latanoprost. There is a, already a fixed combination working on that. And it seems to work very good. We will have to wait the results. You know, Sometimes there are a lot of promise and say, oh, this goes very good. What it was good is that until 1999, 2000, we only had dorsolamide, timolol, <coughs> pilocarpine, and adrenaline. Suddenly came the latanoprost. Latanoprost was for the glaucoma specialist was like, you know, the heat. Because it was the medication that the dose was only once a day. The power was outreach, the beta blockers. And patients has a very good tolerability with very little general side effect. They were only local. So I hope it's going to be the same thing with the new medication. That's a good question. That, no, that is not a good question. That is a very difficult question. Uh, you know, we always said that there is about 10 to 15% of our patients 
that no matter what we do, no matter what we how we control the pressure, they are going to progress. Uh, sometimes, you know, it's, for me, it's the same thing. And I have one case that came to my mind when you asked me about this. It's a normal tension glaucoma patient. And even having 12, 10, 12 of pressure, she was progressing. And, I off and she was not feeling the constriction of the visual field. So when I offered to her to do a surgery, she was like, what? Are you telling me that the best option to stop the progression is to do a surgery? 2020 vision. And I say, well, you know, even all the drops you are using, you're still progressing. And what I'm seeing is that you're going to probably end it blind. So at the end, I did a surgery and slow down the progression. I follow her for about six years. Then I move to another hospital. I don't know what happens to her. I hope she's still fine. But uh, one point when you do a research is that there is a difference between meds and surgery. One of the difference is it seems that the surgery stabilizes the pressure, avoid the fluctuation of the pressure, and it might slow down the progression if you are lucky and the patient is lucky too. So probably, if I'm, if I'm aware that the patient is having a progression, I probably will look for a surgical option. Don't know what, but I will probably look for something more aggressive if I really can uh, show that there is a progression in that patient. <laughs> yeah, I, you know, I had the feeling you were going to ask me something like that. <laughs> and I, did, I do not have a real answer for that. We had a lot of discuss, discussions about the use of alternative therapy, you know, hyperbaric oxygens or ginkgo biloba or some antioxidants or medication that uh, produce a vasodilation. Sometimes I give, I, I, you know, but it's the feeling like I'm going to give something that I don't really know if it's going to be better for the patient or better for my conscience. But I, I believe in, in, in you know, neuroprotection and that some of the factors that produce vasodilation and improve the ocular blood flow might help this kind of patient, absolutely. But there is very, very few literature about it. OK, I have uh, one comment and one question. Where do you think that the technology is leading us? When I did my residency in uh, 1991, I started doing uh, EstraCap. So we have to open like 12 millimeters. And from EstraCap, we went to FACO. And we still have to open like six millimeters incision because we didn't have foldable lens. And then we went to four millimeters, 3.5, 2.2, and mix that we do 1.8 millimeters. So the technology has led to something less invasive than the many years ago. So what do you think that the technology is leading us? Uh, trap, or what is going to occupy those steps? Traps, or maybe those new devices to be implanted in the angle, or laser technology, or maybe new drops with new pharma pharmacology. And the other thing that I want to make a comment is that education of the patient is very important. I have faced many patients that come to my practice here and for cornea problems. And when they're leaving, say, please, could you refill my glaucoma drops? So I say, okay, not a problem. And then I look at the track care. And then I see that the patient was seen one month ago and the medication was prescribed for three months. My first question to that patient is, uh, either you're selling the drops or you share the drops with some member of your family. Because we gave you three models, three, three months of treatment. And this is one month after that, and you already don't have any, any drops. So I, the ones that I saw that video, I believe that if we educate the patients in the right way, and if they apply the drops in the right way, we might obtain a better control of the intraocular pressure and better results. Absolutely agree. I think that the, the as I said, you know, the best treatment using glaucoma is the treatment that is used right. It, there is no, but when we write on, indicate, you know, like a lot of medication because the pressure is in 40. And the patient show up with 40 of pressure, primary open angle glaucoma. You find it at the ER and you say, I'm going to give 
full medication plus Diamox. You know, I think if in, in a lot of those patients, if you give one drop, you try to reduce the pressure by, at the moment, but if you give one drop and you explain properly how to use it and mm -hmm. the people is involved around, probably the, the effect is gonna be as good as the full medication. Why? As I explained, you know, the more complicated the regime of drops is, the less the patient are gonna compliance on it. So we have to try to really make the patients understand. Uh, in some cases it's like, here it's very common, uh, at least I found that, that the patients, it happens also in Spain, they come and they said, you know, I ran out of the medication. Yeah, but well, you, you should not wait until you see the doctor. You mm -hmm. go, you buy it, you, you get it, because this is important to keep the pressure stable. High fluctuation of the pressure cause as much damage as high pressure itself. There is one difference. If you keep the pressure in 30, your optic nerve, your blood vessels are gonna get used to that pressure. But if your pressure is 18 and suddenly you drop the medication and the pressure rise to 30, you, the blood vessels get used to the 15, not the 30. And that's where the, co the problems comes of uh, vessels occlusions and things like that. Where the technology is leading us, I think that there is a lot of money involved in this. Uh, there is a lot of research. There is a lot of research in, in surgical devices. The in-focus will come out. The in-focus is like the shen, but it's uh, applied from the outside to the inside. Uh, I think that all the glaucoma surgeons likes to reduce the size of our surgeries. Uh, a lot of medication are gonna come out as I explained. Uh, I think that there is a huge revolution in the, in the following years. We're gonna hear a lot of news. What is the risk in this? The risk in this is that sometimes we get too much hurry on trying to put in our practice some of the devices, and then five years later came the, the CPAS case. You know, mm -hmm. the, the side effect of some of these devices, we don't know. They are gonna come, and then what are we gonna do with those patients in which we promise us to control the glaucoma with this device and the device is causing this other problem? You know, it's a, it's a complicated situation in that way. But there is, there's gonna be a lot of things. For the ones that are gonna thinking about joining the glaucoma, that will be the field. You know, you're gonna be excited with all the surgeries, with all the medication and with all the pathology we're gonna have. Um, I strongly believe that there is a lot of coming on for uh, new technology for treatment. Uh, but there is also something good. Uh, they are in the phase two right now in the United States for um, a device that is placed through the pars plana with a neuroprotective factor, a neurograph factor. And this is gonna be very good for the patients who already have a very severe optic nerve damage that uh, according to this uh, phase two trials, most of these patients improve um, in the visual fields and improve the results on the uh, optic nerve OCT. I, I think that this is gonna be something that besides the treatment, this is something that we have to keep an eye on it. Yep, absolutely agree, yep. Yeah. Any other question? Well, I think that uh, thank you for coming and thank you for Dr. Conrad for being here. <laughs>